Good morning, everybody. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. This is Victory Sunday. Not because of the Jaguar. No. <laughs> Wrong. That was at All Tell State. Whatever. I, I, whatever that place is down there. Uh, not because of the Jaguars, because of Jesus, because every day is Victory Sunday, right? You guys with me? Okay, today is actually Epiphany Sunday, and this is the last Sunday of the Christmas season. All the decorations come down, and we're going to talk a little bit more about what Epiphany is, but it's basically a revelation, a shining forth of God revealing who he is in his son in the person of Jesus. That's what Epiphany is all about. And I wanna read a prayer to you as we open up this time of worship, a prayer that was crafted and written specifically for this Sunday. Would you bow your hearts and pray this with me? Heavenly Father, who by the leading of a star, you manifest your only begotten son to the peoples of the earth. Lead us who know you now by faith into your presence where we may see your glory face to face through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's worship the Lord together.
to worship you, God. We open up our hearts to you in this place, in our homes. God, we are so thankful for your presence in our lives, for your grace and your mercy that's new every morning. And it's because of all that you've done and because of who you are, Jesus, that we lift up our worship to you today. Be lifted high on our praise, God. Father, be glorified in this place. So worthy, Jesus. So worthy, Jesus.
He's never failed, He's never failed us. Remember that His name, He'll make a way, He'll make a way. From the cross to the grave, He is risen and He reigns. Praise the Lord. Come on, we're going to sing that one more time. Some of you need to be reminded this morning. Oh, just remember how our God, He's never failed, never failed us. Remember that His name will make a way. Yes, it will. From the cross to the grave, He is risen and He reigns. Praise the Lord. Sing His praise again. to pray together corporately. There's a couple of us up here and we're gonna just pray for a couple minutes over different topics. As we go into the 10 days of prayer, which begins tomorrow, it's so important when we're together to just join our hearts in unity, amen? So why don't you just join me? We're gonna pray first over families and our kids. So Lord, we just come before you together today as a body of believers. And Lord, we thank you first and foremost for our families. And we, as we enter into 2023, we commit them to you in your hands. God, I just pray a covering and a protection over marriages. I pray for unity between the spouses, Lord. I pray right now, Lord, that any issues that may have dwelt in 2022, God, I pray for breakthrough in those areas, whether it's finance, whether it's a communication issue, maybe there's a sin issue, God. I just pray right now for supernatural breakthrough and that as we enter into 2023, our family units would be strong. They would be centered on your word, that Lord, we would be unified with you as the center and God, I just pray over our children, God, no matter what age they are at, or maybe it's grandchildren, you have grandchildren in this room, God, we just pray a covering over them. We thank you, Lord, that you have not given them a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So I just pray a sound mind over all of our children as they go into their schools, as they play sports, as they're confronted with friends and peers, Lord. I pray that you would surround them with the right friends. We pray the right people into their lives, mentors, spiritual mothers and fathers that can coach them and teach them and lead them the way. I pray for confidence for all of our parents to teach our children the word and the ways of, of you. God, we are equipped by you, by your spirit, by your word, let us boldly and confidently teach our children. We don't have to rely on the church to do that. We as parents can do that. And so God, I pray confidence, godly confidence over our parents and over our children, that they would know who they are, that they would know that they are yours and that they are secure in who you've made them to be. They don't need to be anybody else. They are secure in who you've made them to be, God. So give us boldness, give us unity, Lord, as we go into 2023 and fill us with your power to reach out to others and to be a light wherever our feet step. In Jesus' name. The Lord's mercy is new every morning and it's new this morning and here for us. The Lord says, come all you who are weary and I will give you rest. And I lift up those that are emotionally weary, first of all, that have just been struggling and, Lord, looking for that traction, that word, that encouragement, Lord God. And I know you see them, and they're in this midst, Lord God, and I pray and speak encouragement, revival. Lord, I pray, Lord God, for a special touch for those that are emotionally weary, Lord God. I pray for those that are struggling financially, Lord God. You are the provider that I lift up those, Lord God. That stress of finances, Lord God, that tries to hang on, Lord. I pray that you cut that off of them. Show them the way, Lord. Give them the wisdom and discernment, Lord. I pray for those that are in rocky relationships of any kind, Lord God. May your forgiveness and your mercy and your love flow through those, Lord. Allow pride to cease, Lord God and for you to just melt the hearts of those that have broken relationships. Lord, I pray for those that are in need physically, Lord God, that need a healing touch from you, Lord God, fighting very hard battles in their health, 
And I just plead the blood of Jesus over them, Lord God. I pray for your healing path for each one here that we've mentioned, your healing path. And I pray that you speak to your people. I pray that your people's hearts are open, Lord, to bring those things to you, that maybe they haven't even articulated that to you before, Lord God. But now you touch them and allow them the freedom to come forth and share those things with you that are on their heart. And Lord, to come to the loving Father who loves them and has a healing path for each one of them. In the precious name of Jesus, amen. Lord, thank you so much for your love for us. Jesus, we just welcome you in this place, Lord. We want more of you. Just welcome your presence, Lord. I just pray right now in this moment, Lord, you can just minister to all those that you love. We can encounter you in a new way right now. Come, Holy Spirit. Jesus, you came and you declared the kingdom. You said your kingdom is here. You taught us to pray thy kingdom come. And God, it's my prayer that you can use this church, that you can use us to reveal your kingdom here on earth. That that invisible kingdom becomes visible. God, that all upon Avedra, Nocatee, Jacksonville, the mission field, the surrounding areas, all the nations, Lord, can experience the love that you have for them, Lord. That a new hunger, a hunger that only you can fill, Lord, can be filled by your blood and by your bread, Lord God, your body. We thank you, Jesus. And Lord, I just pray that as a church, we can fulfill that kingdom calling, a kingdom calling of both doing and telling so that all can see that the rule and reign of Jesus Christ is here and now. And so, God, we just come before you right now, understanding that you've prepared us. You've prepared each of us individually, and for some of us, it looks different. But, God, as a church, we just say before you, God, we want to be ready. We welcome, Lord, the ministry that you have for us. We welcome, Lord, the more. Lord God, we want to be surrendered and we want your help in being surrendered so that we can be obedient because we know on the other side of that obedience is experience. So God, help us to have full passion for all that you have for us. That the joy that only comes from you can be seen in each of our lives. We pray in the mighty name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's continue to worship this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Let it be so, Jesus. Worship you.
worship this morning. Tell him that he's worthy. Tell him that he's holy. God be exalted from this place. Be lifted high, Jesus. The name above every name. Holy worship and will never stop. Day and night, night and day, let him censor us. Just one more time this morning. God, for the way that you meet us when we come before you in worship, when we come together as your people. God, we know that you are here in this place, that you are present in our homes as we worship you this morning. God, and we thank you for this moment, for this opportunity that you've given us to not only worship you through song, but to pray together, to lift up our requests before the Lord. Father, would you be glorified in this place? Would you be magnified through our worship and through our lives? God, we know that you alone are worthy. And so we declare that together this morning. 
And it's in your powerful and beautiful name of Jesus that we pray together. Amen. Come on, church, one more time. Let's lift up a shout of praise to the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Normally, we would release the kids, but we're going to wait just a few minutes, so stick with your parents. And as you're seated, would you take a moment to say good morning to someone around you? All right, good morning, Redeemer Church. Hope you guys are having a great morning so far. If you don't know me, my name is Ben. I'm the student director here at Redeemer Church. And if you are a guest here this morning in person or online, I just want to extend an extra welcome to you. In fact, we have a card that's in the seat pocket in front of you. If you could fill that out and then after service, head straight out those doors through the double glass doors and then you'll see this giant welcome center. We love to meet you. We love to get to know you just a little bit and spend a little bit of time with you. And then if you're online, we love to get to know you as well. So there's a connect button getting dropped into the chat. It's also at the top of your screen so that we can get connected with you as well. We have Growth Track Step 2 happening right after the service lunch and child care is provided. But here's what Growth Track is. is basic, it's the next step in your spiritual journey. That's what it is. And if you are, have been a Christian for a long time, a short time, we want to take the next step with you. So you'll get to know just a little bit about the church, what we stand for, our mission. You'll get to know yourself and your spiritual giftings and how you can use those spiritual giftings to help further the kingdom here in Nakati, Pontevedra, and around the world. So we'd love for you guys to be a part of the growth track happening right after this service at 12. We have the 10 days of prayer coming up starting tomorrow. All right, so 6 a.m., bright and early, come on out and spend the first little bit of your morning with us. We want to start this year off right. We want to dedicate this year to the Lord. If you're going through things, if you need questions answered. We'd love to stand with you and pray with you. And so come on out as we corporately pray for the next 10 days. And we just give over the first part of the year to seek what God has for us in 2023. So 6 a.m. Monday through Friday, all the way through the 18th. And we'd love for you guys to be a part of that. We love to worship the Lord here at Redeemer Church. One of the ways that we love to worship the Lord is through our giving. So there's a couple of different ways that we can give this morning. We can give with the QR code. If you're online, there's a button getting dropped into the chat right now. It's also at the top of your screen. You can hit that as well. It'll direct you to the correct site for you guys. But also, what we also love to do is we also love to lift up other churches in prayer because they're not our competition. They are, they're, they're our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we want their success because their success is our success because we're working for the same. It's, it's, like, it's like a football team. Go Jaguars. It's like a football team. We're all under the same head coach going the same direction. We all have different jobs. We all have different positions, and we're all heading the same directions, just like the Jaguars are heading straight to the Super Bowl. All right? I'm speaking it. I'm, please, Lord. All right, so it just came to me. I didn't say that first service. But today's, today's church that we're, speak, that, that we're praying for is Ocean Park Baptist Church. And they have asked us, and Pastor Chris has asked us to pray for his congregations. They focus on reading scripture and memorizing scripture this year. That it won't fall on, on deaf ears, but it'll get rooted into their hearts. And we'll see the fruit of that through their church. So we're going to lift them up and Pastor Chris as we pray for our offering. So let's pray. Father, we just come to you so grateful that we have a place that we can corporately worship you and get to know you so that we can become more like you. We want our lives to resemble you. So, Father, as we, as we give forth our tithes and offerings, we ask that you use it to further your kingdom here in Nakatee, Pontevedra, and around the world. Father, we want to see more people come to Christ. And we ask that as Ocean Park Baptist Church starts to really read their Bible, start memorizing your scripture, and start really rooting it into their hearts. Father, we ask that it doesn't fall on rocky ground, but it falls on good soil, so, that, so it springs up and produces good fruit, so that the people around their church can see it, and they go, what do they have that I don't? And they can share the love of Christ, because it's overflowing in their life. Father, we pray that over our church as well. In Jesus' name. And thank you, Ben. Ben has some big faith. A Super Bowl thing, huh? 
I had one other announcement I wanted to let you know about. This coming Saturday, January the 14th, we are hosting a Gordon-Conwell Community Day. Gordon-Conwell is an amazing seminary. Uh, they have four locations, two in Massachusetts, one in uh, North Carolina, and one here in Jacksonville. And uh, Dr. Cho is going to be speaking here Saturday. It's free. It's open to all of you to come. You know, one of the things that we talk about uh, in, our, in Growth Track, Ben mentioned Growth Track, is we talk a little bit about what we mean by a fully devoted follower of Jesus. Our mission statement is to reach people with the life-giving message of the gospel so that they may become fully devoted followers of Jesus. But what does that look like? A fully devoted follower might look different to you than the person beside you. And so in Growth Track, we define what it looks like here. What we focus on, there's five core characteristics that we focus on. They're not the only ones, but we believe these are core characteristics to being a fully devoted follower of Jesus. And one of those is that we're fully devoted to God's word. All of us, everybody on staff, all of our leadership, our church congregation, that we're fully devoted to God's word, to reading it, to studying it, to continue to grow in it. And so here we have an opportunity to have a professor uh, from Gordon Conwell, one of the leading seminaries in the country, to be right here with us Saturday. She will be giving a lecture called Leading Servantship for God's Joy. I think it's a word that she made up, but when you have as many PhDs as she has, you can make up some words. Um, she is the dean of Gordon Conwell Institute and Gordon Conwell Associate Professor of Intercultural Studies. Uh, the joy of leading servantship is not something to be pursued, but rather something that ensues from the joy of the Lord in which our joy is made complete. This is what she's going to be talking about. There'll be discussion, there'll be refreshments and coffee. Uh, so be sure to join us if you can. It's free. Uh, Dr. Cho is an amazing communicator. She's originally from Korea. She, cre she also speaks in several Korean the uh, uh, seminaries. And so that's going to be Saturday morning, 10 a.m. Everybody say 10 a.m. 10 a.m., it's free for you. Come and join us as we host this Gordon Conwell Community Day. Also, I wanted to give you an update on Pastor David Sheffield. I know many of you love Pastor David and Robin and have been asking about him and want to let you know what's going on with him right now. Today is his eighth day being at home. So they originally uh, thought that he had the flu, but what turned out is he had uh, congestive heart failure. And yeah, that's kind of a big deal. And so there's fluid on his lungs and in, around his heart. But they've got most of that fluid clear now. He's been home recovering. He's feeling better every day. One thing that was never affected was his sense of humor. And if you know David, you know, he's in the chat right now and he's probably cracking some jokes even right now uh, online in the chat. But they also wanted to, he and Robin wanted to convey to all of you their gratitude for your prayers, your thoughtfulness, bringing meals over, reaching out to them. They've just been overwhelmed by your support. Thank you for that. Continue to pray for them. And uh, David will be back soon, but continue to pray for his strength and his healing. Amen? Today is Epiphany. Epiphany is the Sunday closest to January 6th. Uh, from Christmas to January 6th, that's the 12 days of Christmas. And uh, January 6th is Epiphany, and the Sunday nearest January 6th is the one in which you celebrate the Feast of Epiphany. There are a couple of passages from Scripture that are dedicated to this day, uh, because Epiphany is a, it's an appearance, a miraculous revelation, a phenomenon. It is a Christian feast intended to celebrate the shining forth of revelation of God in the human form in the person of Jesus Christ. That's what Epiphany is. And so there are two primary passages. One is the visit of the Magi, which we heard throughout Christmas. We're going to hear it again here in just a moment. The other is Jesus' baptism. When he comes to John and he's baptized, and there's this revelation where God says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. These are the two primary passages that are given from the Gospels for this particular Sunday, this idea of this revelation of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Eastman, would you come and read? He's going to read Matthew chapter 2. Would you please stand with me for the reading of the gospel? Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes and all the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, 
are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem saying, go and search diligently for the child. And when you found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before him until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and they worshiped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. The word of the Lord. You may be seated, and at this time, we're going to release the kids to go with Pastor Eastman and his team, and they're going to bring them back at the end of the message so that you can receive communion as a family if you choose to do that. Let me ask you a question. How many of you grew up watching cartoons? How many of you grew up watching cartoons on Saturday morning? Like, remember, that used to be the only time. That was before cartoons had their own network. And, you know, one thing I noticed early on was during cartoons, the commercials were different than at other times. The commercials were specifically targeting me because it's all about me. I mean, the commercials were Cookie Crisp, Fruity Pebbles, G.I. Joe, right? These are the things. And here's what I noticed, though. When I would go visit my grandparents and we would go out doing things in the day, my grandmother always had to be back at the house by 2 o'clock so that she could see her stories, she could see her stories. She had some stories. And I noticed that during her stories, the commercials were much different than they were during cartoons. During her stories, we didn't hear about Fruity Pebbles and G.I. Joe. We heard about Calgon, take me away. We heard about, I could bring home the bacon fried up in a pan and never let you forget you're a man. I mean, who were those commercials targeting? Not me. They were targeting grandmother, right? That's right. See, here's the thing. We kind of grow up in this environment where things cater to us, to what we want, to our desires, to our likes, our dislikes. And so we grow up in this very commercial-oriented culture. And it caters right to, oftentimes, the, one of the worst parts of our human condition, our selfish nature. It caters right to that. See, all of us are a direct result of the things that we continually surround ourselves with. We've grown up in this culture. There's no way this culture has not influenced us, right? And, and now what happens is, now we're believers, we're followers of Jesus, we're a church in the midst of this culture. And that same attitude oftentimes still creeps into even how we approach our faith and even how we approach worship. We come for different reasons. We come because we want to get something from the Lord. We're trying to, you know, connect with something. I think C.S. Lewis really captured it well. He was one of the greatest Christian thinkers of the 20th century, and he said this. I've always had a mercenary heart, willing to give my love to the highest bidder. I think that is very self-aware and very honest of C.S. Lewis to say that. I've always had a mercenary heart. Willing to give my love to the highest bidder. And this is sometimes even, I think, how people end up approaching faith and how we, as people of faith, sometimes try to lure people in is by the promises of God, what it's going to do for their life, by all these things, right? So we're, we're still trying to advertise to what it means for them. We're still trying to pull in the same, still, I, of course I'm going to follow. I'm going to give my love to the highest bidder. God's promises seem better than all these other promises, so I'll do that. And I don't think this is a good thing for the human heart. When it's all about us, we begin to believe it's all about us. And that is a dangerous place. Through my years of doing ministry and talking to people here and in places I meet them in other, you know, other um, environments, is I've heard so many people say they quit going to church. And they say, I, quit. I just don't get anything out of it. I mean, I went for a while, I just don't get anything out of it. 
is that why we go to church? Is that, what, is that our reason for being here even today? I go to get something out of it. And people say this and they're being very honest about it. Well, I can, you know what? I can find preachers online and actually get better messages out of that than what I was getting at the church. Well, that might be true if that's why you go to church. To get something out of it. Maybe the fact that you go to church and don't get something out of it, maybe that's actually a good thing. Think about the wise men. We're talking about Eastman just read this reading where these, these wise men, they come to seek him out. And there's something else about this revelation of who God is and about the visit of the Magi. Is these were the first Gentiles to come in and to begin to worship. And so already God is fulfilling his promise that even the Gentiles are going to be brought into the promises of, of God, the covenant promise. And they come and they come to seek him, to worship him and offer their gifts to him. They didn't come to seek him to get something from him. They didn't bring their petitions to him. They didn't bring their requests to him. They didn't come in and go, look what all these great things we've done for you. Now you can do this for us. They came to worship him and to offer their gifts to him, not to get something from him. But I think so many times we go to church with the wrong motivation. We go to get something. We're looking to get something. Think about what they even did. They left their home. They left their country. They took a journey that probably even at some point uh, required a risk, you know, could be a hazardous journey. And they go through all this effort to get there to worship him. They left those things to seek him out. And they brought gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. And sometimes we talk about there being three wise men. That's what we see like in the nativity scene. And we don't know that there were actually only three. We say that because there were three gifts offered, gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. So there was likely others there and an entourage that came with them. And these gifts, as scholars and theologians and religious philosophers have pointed out to us, these three gifts actually symbolize something. The gold is symbolic of the king. This is a gift you would give to a king, and it it reflects the kingship of who Jesus is. Frankincense, this is what the high priest would, they would use incense when they would go in and they would worship. And then myrrh is what you would use to anoint a body for burial. And so already is the foreshadowing that this is the king and the high priest who will be our sacrifice. There's so many meaningful things about this, and they come and they worship. They bring their gifts. They came to worship. Here's my point today, one of my points. But here's something that if you walked away with, I will feel really good that you got this. We live in a culture that caters to our selfish indulgences. Worship is one of the greatest ways to break out of that. As long as we don't come to worship with the same attitude to get something again. So many times, see these wise men, they went to worship and you know what? They got there to worship and they didn't need it to be the right song list, the right temperature, the right lighting, the right people said hi to them on the way in. You know, they didn't, they came to worship him without those things. And so many times I think we come in and if it's not the right song or the right temperature or the right lighting, and if somebody didn't say hi to us, we can't even worship. Because thank you, April. Uh, because we're coming, because we're coming to get something, instead of coming just to give and coming just to worship. Worship helps us break out of the trap of thinking that it's all about me. And by worship, I don't just mean singing; that's part of worship. But actually, the way the Bible describes worship, Jesus said, "True worshipers worship the Father in spirit and in truth, or spirit and in reality." It's like yes, we do the spiritual thing, but also the way we live. Paul said, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is your spiritual act of worship. You want to be spiritual? Then love people, forgive people, serve people. Offer your body as a living sacrifice. This is your spiritual act of worship. And worship breaks us out of the trap of thinking that it's all about me. Eugene Peterson said this. He said, worship is when we interrupt our preoccupation with ourselves and attend to the presence of God. That's what these magi were doing. They were leaving their own homes, their own kingdoms, their own things, coming to worship. Worship the Lord. And worship helps us do that, to break out of that, our preoccupation with ourselves. In fact, if you go to church and you don't get anything out of it, maybe that's a good thing. Because maybe it isn't about you. 
May, who gets more out of our worship anyway, God or me? You know, so I want to come and not worship my worship and not worship an experience. I want to come and worship. Now, you will get something. You know, you're going to hear from the, the, you're going to hear from the word. You're going to come to the table. And there will be times when you encounter the Lord and it changes you. But it isn't about that. If you come and you don't feel anything, that might be okay. It isn't just about a feeling. When you read the Bible, when you spend time in prayer, we're going to do the 10 days of prayer, you might come every morning at 6 a.m. and not feel anything. You might come and say the prayers and do the thing and go about your day, and you didn't feel anything. That's okay, because that may actually be the Holy Spirit working in your heart to mature you, to grow you, to help you get past that place where everything has to be about you. It helps us break away from that. I heard an interview once with Mother Teresa, and she was talking about there was some point in her ministry that she did not feel the Lord anymore. She could not feel God. And it bothered her so much. She went and she talked to her spiritual director about it, and she said, here's what's going on, and I can't feel anything, and I don't know where the Lord is and all this. And somewhere in that process, she said the Lord spoke to her and said, is that why you do it? To just get a feeling. And she had to make a decision. She said, no, it isn't. It's because the people I serve, she had such a ministry to, to the least of these. And she said, it's because the people I serve carry your image and I honor you and I worship you and I'll do it to the day I die, even if I don't feel anything else. Well, thankfully, it didn't stay like that. But that was the point that she had to get to to say, no, it's not about just a feeling. And if you're, if you're following the Lord and you're praying and you're seeking God and you're not feeling anything, you're not messed up. That's okay. That may actually be the Lord working in you to mature you beyond your feelings and beyond your emotions. But it probably won't stay like that. There'll be times when you do feel things. There'll be times when something does really speak to you. There'll be time when the music happens just right and somebody sings a certain note and you get goosebumps everywhere and you go, okay, now that was the Lord. No, that was just a nice feeling. It's bigger than that. And that's what Epiphany reminds us. Jesus is who the Bible says he is. And we honor him and we come to worship him because of who he is. We're, we're talking about God, the God of the universe, the God that threw the stars out across the sky, the God that ordained all of your days before one of them came to be, the God that is so merciful that you're able to breathe right now. That's the mercy and grace of God. He's worthy if only for that. But the truth is I can experience God. I can actually connect with God. You know, I can feel God. Sometimes when I just stand outside, sometimes I get so busy here in the office, I'll just go outside somewhere, I'll go over there by the lake, and I'll just stand still, still for a moment and just feel the breeze and the sun. Or you go to the ocean and you hear the ocean and you're reminded, God is here. God is with me. And you're worthy. Even if all the other things that I think are so important don't work out the way I think they should, God, you're worthy. He's worthy of our worship. And so Epiphany reminds us of this. A couple of things we can learn from the wise men is, number one, seek him, even if it requires great effort. Seek him. Seek him to worship him and to know him. I love what the apostle Paul said in Philippians. And Paul had a revelation of who Jesus was. He had this amazing transforming experience on the road to Damascus. And then throughout his ministry, he saw the Lord working in his life. He was a Pharisee. He was a scholar. He studied the Old Testament scriptures. And he recognized, yes, this is, who, this is Jesus. He is the Messiah. He understood all these things. He saw miracles happen. And now here in Philippians, near the end of his life, he's in prison. This is one of the last things that he wrote. This is what the apostle Paul says. After all of that, he says... Forgetting everything that's behind. It doesn't matter. Forget all that. I press on to know the Lord. Paul said, this is my heart cry, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I may know him. This was the thing that motivated him. God that created everything is knowable and you can know him. What is more important than that? And this was Paul's pursuit. He, he was seeking the Lord to know the Lord, not to just get something from him, but to know who he is. That's pretty powerful. That's my prayer too. I want to know God, and I want to continue to get to know God. And 
you get to know God, you know, through worship, through study, through prayer, all these things that we do, not to create like a to-do list for you. These are things you do to invest in a relationship. And then what happens is you gain knowledge and depth of insight. And Paul says, my prayer is that your love would grow through knowledge and depth of insight. The more knowledge and depth of insight you have, the greater your love grows. This is true in your relationship with God. It's true with relationship with people that you're in, are in your life. So when you're reading the Bible, don't read the Bible just to get some new revelation so that you can post it on Facebook or so that you can go tell your friends, look at this cool thing the Lord showed me so that I can feel all spiritual about myself. It's still the wrong motivation. Read the Bible just to know him. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. I get to know him through knowing his word. Not so that I can go impress people with some new revelation I got. Look what the Lord showed me and sound all spiritual. It's really feeding some ego need in my own heart just to know him. When I pray, pray just to know God. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody that you kind of got the impression the only reason they're talking to you is because they want something from you? Does that feel very good? It doesn't. But so many times that's what we do when we come to the Lord. Let's, let's pray and talk to him just to get to know him. Some of those other things happen. That's why Jesus said, look, seek first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added unto you. you know, they're, they're important, yes, but seek him to know him, not to get something from him. You will know him through his word, through prayer, through the world around you. He's revealing himself. He says, go to the ant, consider its ways and be wise. God will use nature to reveal himself to you. They sought him not to get something from him, but to bring him worship. And they literally had to leave some place to come do that. Sometimes you physically have to disconnect and separate yourself from certain things. That's why like this 10 days of prayer is kind of important. If you can join us, we'll be here at 6 a.m. But breaking your routine, interrupting your preoccupation with your own routine and your own things, just coming and doing something like that, sometimes that alone is the thing you need that brings you into that deeper place, a place of separation. Maybe you can't get here at 6 a.m., but you do it in some way. These next 10 days, let's spend some extra time just in prayer. We're going to have somebody every day leading a devotion, then we'll have time for individual prayer, then we'll come back together for corporate prayer. But if you can't join us, still do this in your own time, devoting the next 10 days to just spending time in prayer. Physically, you have to disconnect and separate. Separation is often a place of revelation. Uh, sure. Sorry, they're giving me hand signals down here. They think my voice needs something. That's pretty refreshing. Thank you. But separation is a place of revelation. You see this in a lot of places in Scripture, like the Mount of Transfiguration, where they separate from other distractions. They go up on the Mount of Transfiguration. There they get this revelation of who Jesus is. And you see this in lots of places. And so what sometimes we have to do is literally disconnect, separate ourselves. It's a place of revelation. And revelation is a place of clarification. When you receive a revelation, it brings clarity. It's a place of clarification. When they were on the transfiguration and they get that revelation of who Jesus is, it was very clear. You know, at the baptism of Jesus, several other occasions like this, but we need to separate ourselves to receive it sometimes. Several years ago, I was facing some big decisions and I had lots of different opinions and lots of different thoughts about what to do. And I was scheduled to go with some other people to a conference, but I decided that I was going to go by myself because I just needed to separate. And I was at the conference, and there were speakers that were you know, sharing, and there was worship times, and I was there just to really, God, I just need to connect with you. I need, I need clarity. And it was during that conference that I really did receive clarity and kind of a revelation of what I needed to do. Actually, it's not totally true. I knew what I needed to do. I just needed clarity to have the courage to do it. Because when you get a revelation, you get that clarification, it gives you inspiration and motivation. And that's exactly what I needed. You might be needing that in your life right now. 
And I encourage you, man, right here as we're starting at the beginning of this year, to do something to separate from other distractions and to seek the Lord. I read about Leonardo da Vinci and the story behind his famous painting of the Last Supper. And uh, you, might, you might be familiar with the story, but one of the things that he did is when he was painting Judas, he decided to really stick it to one of his enemies. And he painted the face of his enemy on the face of Judas Iscariot, the traitor. And he thought, man, that's clever. But then when he got to the face of Jesus, he couldn't finish the painting. Everything was finished except Jesus, and he couldn't. And this was going on and on and on. And finally, it was in a time of solitude and reflecting on that that he realized he couldn't paint Jesus because of what he'd done to his enemy and that there was unforgiveness in his heart. He couldn't see Jesus because of his own unforgiveness. He went and changed the painting, and then he was able to finish it. The whole point was it was when he separated into this time of solitude and reflection that he was able to actually get clarity on what was going on in his own heart. It's a place of revelation. And revelation leads to clarification, and that clarification will lead to inspiration and motivation. Remember that. So here's the question. Am I seeking to worship him just because he's worthy? Listen, and you got to be honest with your own heart about this because we know the right answers to say. Am I seeking him just because he's worthy or am I seeking something from him, his provision, his blessing, his promise? Or is it just because you're God and you're worthy and I want to know you because you've been gracious and good to me? Not seeking these other things. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom. These other things will be added. Second thing is this. So the first thing is, like the, like the magi, like the wise men, make great effort to seek him. Second is this. Offer your gifts to him. Seek him to worship him and offer your gifts to him. And I don't mean, I'm not talking about tithes and offerings. I'm not talking about money. Your gift may be to make money, and that may be part of what you offer to the Lord. Lord, this is a gift you've given me. How can you use it for your glory? But we all have different gifts. You do have something to give. You don't have to be like Eastman. You don't have to be able to play 30 different kinds of ukuleles <laughs> and happy that it's Thursday. Sometimes I'm not happy that it's Thursday. He's happy that it's Thursday. woo He does that thing, you know, he does. <laughs> you just got to be you. Right? That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, as he says, he, he, he equates the body of Christ to the human body. Like, it's all different. There's a hand, there's a foot, there's an eye, there's an ear, there's a nose, there's a mouth, there's hair, there's fingernails, you know? It all, but all of it's part of the body. You, you have something to offer. You do have something to offer. In fact, Paul says this to the Ephesians. He says, you, you're created for this. You're created for good works in Christ Jesus. It doesn't mean you have to be Billy Graham. That's his good works. It means you got to be you. Just be you. And offer who you are to the Lord. That's what Paul meant by offering our bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord. Lord, these are my gifts. Use them. I bring them to you however you desire to use them. You don't have to be the smartest. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 says, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. You don't have to be the smartest. That's good news. I just got to be me. I want to continue to grow. I want to learn. I want to be smarter. But it's not required for me to be the smartest to do something for the Lord. You don't have to be the richest. In Luke chapter 2, there's an offering that's being received, and Jesus sees what's going on, and he kind of stops the whole show. Even though people have come up and given big offering, Jesus stops it when this widow comes and offers just a few coins. And he says, all these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had to live on. It was about what she was offering to the Lord as a sacrifice, not about the amount it's not about how good you are, rich you are, smart you are. It's about offering him what you have. It's because of, he's worthy. Am I seeking him to worship him just because he's worthy? And am I giving my gifts to him or am I seeking gifts from him? 
It's not about getting a feeling. It's not about getting something. Epiphany reminds us who Jesus is. He's the Messiah, the Savior of the world. He was the king, the high priest, the sacrifice for our sins. That's who he is. He's worthy. Even if, even if like Mother Teresa, even if I never felt it again, even if he didn't do anything else in my life, he, he's still worthy because he's God and he's Savior. He loves you. He created you to do good things. Worship him, offer your gifts to him. Would you stand with me today? Now, like C.S. Lewis said about having a heart that is willing to sell itself to the highest bidder, a mercenary heart, it takes honesty to say those kinds of things. I don't want anybody feeling guilty, condemned, or judged that you've had wrong motives or that whatever, because we all do, but it's about getting our heart realigned the right way. Man, because listen, I do it with wrong motives. I don't mean to, I just, because I'm selfish, I have a selfish nature at times, I come in and I'm coming to get something. And let me say, we can be so sneaky about this, especially when you know a lot of Bible and you know a lot of religious stuff, you can... And you can really make it look right, even though it's wrong in your heart. There have been a couple of times when I've given some kind of gift that was very significant for me, a significant, a significant sacrifice, and I did it anonymously to be a blessing, but then I secretly hoped they would find out so that I get both blessings, the blessing of doing it anonymously and then the blessing of being known for what a great thing I did. Isn't that horrible? I mean, that's how our hearts are. I'm being honest with you because I want you to be honest with yourself. In those moments, what do you do? You repent. God, forgive me for the wrong motive of my heart. I want my heart to be right. I want my heart to be pure. I want my heart to be devoted to you because if you're God, you're worthy. And so maybe that's where you are today. I'm just gonna lead us in a prayer and we're just gonna all admit we've done that in some way in our thoughts, our own agendas. I'm gonna pray a prayer of confession and then a prayer of salvation, a prayer of just confessing Jesus as our Lord, embracing him as Messiah and Savior. And then Jared's gonna come and lead us in communion. Would you bow your hearts before the Lord and just repeat after me? You pray this, you make it your own prayer. I'll give you the words, but you pray it. If you're home, pray this along with us as well. Make it your prayer. Let's pray this together. Heavenly Father, I confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. Have mercy on me and forgive me through your Son, my Savior. Lord Jesus, I believe you lived on this earth you died for my sin. You rose and now live. I surrender to you. Be my Lord. The Holy Spirit, fill me with power and passion to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. At this time, we'd like to invite all those who profess to be followers of Christ to join us in celebrating communion. If you've not yet received your communion elements, if you'll raise your hand, our ushers will be coming up the aisles and they'd be happy to provide you with that at this time. Once you've received your communion elements, if you'll go ahead and open those so that you'll be ready to uh, participate with us um, when we celebrate communion together. Um, you know, on Wednesday nights, we've been walking through the Pentateuch and um, this week we're looking at the atoning sacrifices. And yes, this is a shameless plug for midweek. But um, <laughs> as, we were, as we were walking through those uh, atoning sacrifices, the sin sacrifices, my favorite is, is the peace offering. Because in the great thing about the peace offerings, offering is that it's unique in that um, there is this, this blood sacrifice that's brought and, and put on the altar. But there's a portion that's set aside for the priest and for the person doing the offering. 
and it's this memorial meal that is celebrated between the offerer, God, and the high priest, celebrating the fact that peace has been restored between mankind and God. And this is our memorial meal. This is our memorial portion. This is where we celebrate the peace that's been restored to us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So let's participate in this together. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem, that there may be safety and blessing within the gates and walls of your holy city. And Heavenly Father, we thank you that you loved us so much that even when our hearts were against you and we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, in your mercy you sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, to live and to die as one of us, to take the burden of our sin and our sickness upon himself, and to reconcile us to you once and for all. As we break bread together today, put us in remembrance of that sacrifice and give us a greater understanding of the covenant that we now have with you. We ask that you would sanctify this bread and this cup to be for us the body and blood of your Son, our Savior, and sanctify us also so that we may faithfully serve you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. On the night that our Lord Jesus Christ was handed over to suffering and death, he took bread and he gave thanks. Baruch atah Adonai Elohim Alam Homosi Lechem Min Haaretz. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, ruler of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. And he took it and he broke it. And you do that now. And he gave it to him, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And let's all eat the bread together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup of wine, and again he gave thanks. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, bore priyagafen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. And he gave it to him, saying, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. And again, let's drink the cup together. The Bible teaches us that as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he returns. Let's all stand together and join hands, and we'll pray together the Lord's Prayer, and then afterwards we'll remain standing for one final worship song. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Aren't you glad you came to church today? Is anybody getting ready for an amazing 2023? <laughs> Would you touch somebody, say, it's going to be amazing. Tell somebody that. It is going to be amazing. We're so excited that you're here today. Now, let me remind you, tomorrow morning, 6 a.m. in the morning, we're having prayer right in here. It's going to be a blast. Now, you know, it's easy to shout, you know, Sunday about noon, you know, just, oh, yeah, woo! How do you know it takes faith to shout at 6 a.m.? So come out 6 a.m. tomorrow. Pastor even said you can bring your pajamas. If you want to wear your pajamas, it's okay. As long as you're decent pajamas, you can bring them out. It's going to be fun. We're going to have a blast tomorrow morning, 6 o'clock. It's going to be exciting. You don't want to miss it. Now, if you're here and you need prayer, if you're watching on, you know, Internet, we're so excited that you've joined us. But if you're here watching and you need prayer, we've got our prayer teams on both sides of me. Then also, if you're watching on the Internet, just click the prayer button and someone will be right there. But at the end of the service, if you need prayer in your family, in your finances, in your body, you need God to do something. Please have our prayer partners uh, agree with you in prayer. We're going to release our faith. Now, I'm going to declare God's blessings on you. Receive this from the Lord. Throw your hands up in the air and just be a Holy Ghost Hoover vacuum cleaner. Soak up all the good things God has for you. Would you do that? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. You guys have an awesome week. See you tomorrow.